All right. Welcome, everybody, to uh, this episode of O365A. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about something really important as more organizations adopt Copilot, and that's uh, adoption usage reporting. So uh, we're joined today by Microsoft MVP, Lauren Strand. Thanks for joining, Lauren. Thanks for um, having me. You have a very nifty homegrown solution for um, Copilot usage reporting. Do you want to just uh, walk us through uh, what that looks like and um, the value it provides to uh, organizations who use it? Yeah, sure. Um, so really quickly, um, why I built it was when I got access to the uh, early adopter program of uh, M325 Copilot in September 23. The first thing I had was not enough licenses for the entire organization. So I wanted a way to see who was using it and who wasn't using it that effectively. So we could either redistribute or coach and get them to use it better. And there wasn't enough data available from, well, there actually was pretty much no data available. And I kind of saw the evolution of the Microsoft reporting and it wasn't showing me actual usage down to an individual level. Um, so that's why I built my version, uh, which has gone through a few iterations um, the first one was like looking through uh, M365 audit logs, um, which to be honest, I don't like that approach because it's too much data I have to extract from a sensitivity perspective. Um, but now with a, there's a Copilot uh, AI interaction um, endpoint that you can use and just query. So I built it in, it all sits in Dataverse um, using Power Automate workflows to pull the data into the Dataverse tables and then show up in Power BI. Um, I built it and shared it so that people could customize it how they want because I'm not a Power BI UI expert. Uh, the other day, I've had to figure out the whole journey of what does the data mean? How do I get the data? How I store the data? How do I represent the data? So my hope is that others who can do better things with the data um, will make the UI prettier, will you know, I'm not a data scientist, so I can't, you know, manipulate these things. So the first thing was basically just creating, like, looking at the interactions as well, because the challenge with the data that you get is every interaction is if I um, ask Copart something and get a response, that's two interactions. Um, so I then had to effectively go through, well, hang on, it's not about the interactions, it's actually about the sessions, um, because if I'm in Word, and I'm asking a question that's going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and that might show 18 interactions, right? So if I take out the responses, that's nine interactions that I've done with Word. And if I'm doing that a few times through the day, that would show my Word usage as huge. So what I did is I focused more on the session that says how many individual times that I use it within, or sorry, individual instances that I use it within Word, not how many instances of or interactions that I do within each of those instances. So yeah, it just effectively gives, you know, I can see the most active users. The least active users, I've had feedback on where people have said, oh, that's, you know, that's negative. It's like, well, it doesn't have to be negative. That's not the intent. Um, the reason why I want to pull in data like departments and office locations and things is so that you can filter it down to you know, a department and say, okay, here's the least active users in this department. Here's the most active users in the department. Why don't we go to the least active users and offer to buddy them up with one of the most active users um, so they can learn from each other. So it's not always about, you know, okay, you haven't used it much. We're taking it away. Um, and so, yeah, it was just basically some stats there. Also looking at usage over time. Um, I tried to be a bit fancier here uh, because I wanted to see like, is, for example, like Excel, uh, Copilot and Excel, um, people have had challenges with the value it offers and how well it can do things. So maybe that, you know, would go up over time as they add more functionality or those kind of things. So I wanted to break it down to that individual level. Um, as well as, yeah, just particular individual features, because the other thing as well is um, this data shows more than what's built into the M365 Admin Center because the admin center only shows you the last date of usage of Copilot in an app, as opposed to the amount of usage. So say you last <coughs> used Copilot in Excel three weeks ago. Great. And um, doesn't necessarily also show you that you used Excel three weeks ago. Um, so that was the other thing is I wanted to start to 
give people the ability to like match data up and tell a different story um, as opposed to just like a lens of just Copilot. Um, so yeah, it's just breaking it down in different ways um, to show that, um, you know, how many people are licensed, um, looking at the different locations for it. Um, and yeah, as I said, like the M365 Admin Center doesn't show some of the smaller apps like Forms and Planner. Um, can't remember if it shows Loop, um, but that's the thing is there is Copart usage in other areas of 365 that isn't shown in the out of the box. So yeah, that was why I um, built it. And that's why I shared it so that people could basically adjust, manipulate, and I hope share back with the community. No, oh, that's fantastic. And you know, when you look at the most active users, least active users, all this is important because there's a material cost to co-pilot, right? And mm. um, the, the talk now is return on investment. Want to make sure that people are are using it. And you know, it's also in terms of invest figuring out where to put your calories in user adoption, you want to identify um, you know, departments or individuals that could benefit for, from some training or or user adoption. Um, yeah. Yeah, stuff. yeah. So that's great. Um, quick question. So that was really interesting what you said about uh, instead of the interactions focusing on the session in your reporting, does it actually report like the number of unique user sessions used in Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel? That's all it's actually reporting on. The data is there to show the amount of interactions. I just don't surface that in the actual visual of the report, but the data is there. So behind the scenes, I do actually have all of the data, like both ends of it. Um, actually, sorry, when I say I have both ends, I actually take the body out. I just show the you know, prompt response. So I've got all of those counts. Um, mm -hmm. I do have all of the interactions. Um, it's just that I show the sessions as the count itself. So that's the thing is people could actually, um, you know, go into that, into the Power BI file and adjust it and say, I want to see how much are people using it inside of the app, not just, you know, of the app itself. Um, so, and I think also uh, just really quickly, I also want people to have more context of things. So the ability to have like over time is then to say, well, when did this person get a license? Okay, they got a license at this point and they didn't start using it for three weeks. So is that how long it takes to ramp people up or, you know, so it gives more people context instead of that person's on the least active users. Well, they've had the license for two days. Um, so, yeah. yeah. That's great. Uh, so, Lauren, I was just wondering, like, so I just quickly was looking through sort of like the deployment. So it seems like, you have an app registration that you're using in order to sort of pull the data from, you know, the, you know, I guess from via graph and, and put it in the database. Is there any other um, licensing requirements for like users to have in order to do this? Like, it, is it just that they need to have, uh, <clears throat> you know, like a E3 license where you can have Power Automate and, and or have a Power BI license in order to view? I just just to maybe tell the users that there may be some prerequisites yeah. that they may need. Yeah, so that was, I think in the how the the blog article about how to deploy my version, I did have to put in some prereqs because I discovered that I didn't put them in there originally. Um, Power Automate Premium is the critical one, and that's predominantly because I'm using Dataverse um, and I'm making big HTTP calls in there. Um, and also for larger tenants, it, from a scalability issue, um, the fact that they can do more with um, uh, with a Power Automate premium license in terms of the amount of um, throughput the workflow can have because uh, I've had this in a tenant with 88 users. It's in my personal tenant of six users. Um, I built it in a tenant of, uh, I think, like a 1,000 users. Um, but I've also been told that it's been installed in a tenant of 90,000 licensed Copilot users. Wow. So, yeah, I'd never engineered it for that big. Um, it's made me think, though. But, yeah, um, also the whole thing of would I use Logic Apps instead? No, because with Power Automate Premium, it's a fixed cost. So, sure, it means it may, may not run as fast, but at least it's not going to cost a variable amount every month. Um, and then the other thing would be from a requirement is, um, I guess, Power BI Pro uh, to be able to share the report um, unless they've got Power BI Premium capacity. Um, that's pretty much it. 
I was uh, going to ask cool. if you have ahead, the template available, and I just noticed it's on your GitHub. So all the templates that you showed are uh, up online, yeah. which is awesome. Yeah, that's um, being someone who is autistic and ADHD, I'm very much a case of A, humans are fallible, so the less they have to do, the better, um, myself included. Um, and um, build once, use many. So I'd much rather give people effectively a zip file that they can import that will go do its own thing um, and Power BI template that they just open that will prompt them. So yeah, I much prefer to, I guess the thing is I can't expect people to know what's in my head. I do my best to convey it, but there's a lot of junk in what I write. Uh, so if I can make it as easy as possible to, for people to deploy, um, yeah, that's what I'll do. And if someone was to go in and install the solution, like how long do you think it is to, from a setup if you're a greenfield tenant trying to get these reports in and like the workflows and the dataverse all set up? I think if you are familiar with Power Platform in general, then in theory, it wouldn't take you long. Um, uh, like I guess if I was deploying it in your tenant, I would probably be able to get it going in about 10 minutes tops. Okay. And most of that would be waiting for um, Privilege Identity Manager to elevate me to the right level to give myself the Graph API permissions. Um, someone who's not in my head, I'd probably give them half an hour to an hour, more so just kind of like testing and validating. But realistically, the import of the zip file takes a few minutes. And as long as the bits are there, when you import the solution, it should be asking you, what's your tenant ID? What's your you know, um, app registration ID? What's the secret? And as soon as it's in, it's then just start running. So the solution will be able to get you the 24 hour data, like the last 24 hours pretty quickly. It's then the backfilling that is subjective um, to how many users are licensed for it. Um, but yeah, within, I'd say within half an hour, you'd have something up and going and start collecting some data. How far back can you go? Or how far back does it go? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I honestly don't know, and I couldn't get a clear answer. I put in the workflow for the historical in ingestion 365 days because it didn't reject it when I put it in because I kept going for bigger amounts. It could, in theory, go longer. I don't know. Um, uh, but yeah, because it did start collecting data from, in my tenant at least, that far back. So that way it's not from today we're measuring usage, it's let's go as far back as we can. Uh, just to clarify one thing, Lauren, in terms of what admin permissions and the tenant you need to install the Entry ID app, um, I think it's on your blog, but uh, do you happen to know offhand? Well, generally, what you'd need is two permissions that are... Oh, sorry, do you mean the graph permissions or admin permissions to create it? Admin permissions for the app registration. So um, the documentation for granting any graph API permissions says that you need global admin, which is not actually correct. Uh, what you need is application administrator to be able to create the app reg in the first place, but to grant the graph API... <coughs> the Graph API permissions, you can use uh, Global Admin or you can use Privileged Role Administrator. So that's actually my preference because I don't like to um, PIM up to GA much unless I absolutely yeah. have to. So if I can PIM up to just um, Privileged Role Administrator, grant the um, permissions, then happy days. Yeah, yeah. Global Admin is a dirty word nowadays, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, well, Lauren, I know you have to go, have to run. We really appreciate you coming on. These reports look fantastic, and I encourage anyone who's looking for more in-depth co-pilot adoption metrics to uh, to take a look at them. Uh, we'll put the link on our blog when we do the uh, release of the podcast. Um, so once again, thanks for coming on, and uh, really good stuff, and we'll uh, talk to you later. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye.